Ben. Saint Jean. Saint Jean. Yeah. yeah. I'm Dad. <laughs> Dre. <laughs> yeah, Joe. <laughs> And I'm Jackie McCoy. There you go. Mom. This is Wicked Flannel. Yeah. It's a business that we own locally yeah. in Hampton, New Hampshire. And we sell all things comfortable and New England. Yep. Yeah. And plaid. <laughs> and plaid. That's the yeah. key. Yeah. <laughs> you guys have been in business for less than a year? Yes. Yeah. So we opened up in April of this year. And now um, we have our physical storefront. We also have a website, yep. wickedflannel.com, mm -hmm. and an Instagram, Facebook account that do a lot of specials and things like that. So it's been, it's been evolving a lot. We do a lot of custom work here as well. So. Yep. Yeah. It's been great. Yeah. yeah. So I want to just kick off the conversation. I want to ask you guys a question that we haven't talked about yet. Oh. Um, I would love to know how you guys met. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, so we met. Uh, ben was the sous chef, and I was a waitress at a golf club in Stratham, New Hampshire. Yeah. Okay. Um. <laughs> yeah, we had actually met the year prior to me getting that job. At the, still at the golf club, but well, I wasn't yeah. the sous chef yet. Okay, yeah. Um, but, but she was uh, waitressing. Yeah, so yeah. she was a waitress. So the the, ne the following year, uh, both it was really funny. Both of us liked each other. Had wanted to like go out, never talk to each other. Yeah, <laughs> we're we're terrified that the other one was going to say no, so we never even you know had a conversation about yeah. it. And then the next year. Um, we had planned like this big event with a, a, bunch, a bunch of the other people that we worked with and they all canceled and we ended up going together and yeah. well, lo and behold, <laughs> oh, you like me too? That's great. So, yeah. um, and it, it blossomed from there. Yeah, yeah, That's it was beautiful. fun. Yeah. It was always fun to work together. We would both work. Like I was, I was a student and Ben was a lion cook full time and then he got promoted to sous chef. Um, but we would both work as many hours as we could just to hang out together. Yeah, yeah it was awesome. great. Yeah, kitchen yeah. work is, it takes over your life. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> And then, so how long after that did you get married? Uh, so we got married last September. Yep. Oh, okay. Um, so we met. We met 2015. Yep. Started dating February 2016, mm -hmm. and then we were in the motorcycle accident in July 2016. Oh wow! Yeah, and so then we got married. Yeah, then. it was yeah. like right away. It was, it was actually awful. it was <laughs> when we were in the rehab hospital. Ben was getting really upset about the fact that his leg was in a blood so brace, and he was being told like it will never work again. He's like, I'm not gonna be able to bend my leg, and I said, No, it'll be fine. We'll figure it out. We'll just adjust. Like life will be okay. And he was like, No, no, no. I need to bend my leg, and I was like. Why? What do you need to bend your leg for? And he goes, well, I was planning on proposing yeah. to you, and I need to get down on yep. one knee. Oh so we got unofficially engaged when we were in the rehab yes, hospital. Yes, by accident, but that's okay. It, it ended up working out. Yeah. <laughs> then we got married a couple, two years later. Yep. So you yeah. were you already ready with the ring and everything? Yeah, I had, wow. had I had sketched it out and everything, yeah. and I knew a jeweler yep. who who his, made the yeah. made the whole thing happen. His grandmother um, was a huge part of designing the ring and like getting all the pieces together yeah. um, with her. She had a jeweler friend and a another friend. Who, yeah, uh, in Bedford and um, Derry, New Hampshire. Yeah. So. And actually, that was one of the biggest silver linings of the accident is that right before we left for our trip to Canada, she had been diagnosed with her fourth round yeah, of, of, um, of lymphoma. Lymphoma, And yep. she wasn't gonna seek treatment. When the accident happened, she decided she was gonna go through with a super experimental treatment and neither of us were working yep. for about a year and a half after the accident because of all the injuries and everything. And so we got about eight extra months to spend a lot of time with her, yeah. which we well, didn't. A well, a little bit less. because she had, So uh, we were hit in July um, and she had, they had been talking about doing a stem cell replacement treatment, which is basically they take whatever good stem cells are left in your body and then bring you down to zero. Mm -hmm. And but practically, you know, um, for all intents and purposes, you, you're dead yeah. and then they, re-implant the stem cells that were healthy and let it regrow in your body as a host and then they yeah. bring you back out. Yeah. Um, and it worked for a small amount of time but the cancer eventually came back. It was stronger every time. She'd yeah. been dealing with it for years. Wow. And uh, But with that treatment and the time that we had after the accident not doing anything, we got a chance to spend a lot of time with her which was really, really nice. Yeah. She ended up yeah. passing away that, that December but we got through Christmas together. It was really nice. So yeah, he gave, us, gave us an extra, yeah. Yeah, gave five, us an extra, extra five months. or six months wow. or so. Yeah, so. so that was good because she was a huge part of our lives. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I love <laughs> just throughout like like this experience and and just some of the other stories that you've shared. How even as as you guys as a couple and all of you as a family have gone through like really really serious <laughs> trauma <laughs> in so on so many levels your strength and your optimism 
and um, your your closeness really really shines through, and that's that's you. you know these are things that oftentimes break people yeah, and and families absolutely. and yeah. relationships just because it's a stress unlike any other, and so that's a testament to you guys. And that's what we often hear and like talk about with people is about how statistically we shouldn't even be together yeah. right now, um, like head injury and massive like uh, physical trauma. Yeah. And it's so interesting because we found a way to work through it, but it wasn't easy. Yeah. Like yeah. it took a lot of work, um, but it was, the, I think the most interesting part of our recovery is the hardest part, the part that we really had to like come together on was the fact that he had many super visible injuries and, and almost all of mine were invisible. invisible. Yeah, wow. and that was really challenging yeah. with a lot of people. Like we even had um, somebody close to us tell Molly, uh, you know, well, you you really got the <laughs> bad end of the stick on the deal. Like, oh, he got he got it a lot worse in the accident. When yeah. in reality, when we got hit, Molly was in a coma for nine days. Yeah. She had a subarachnoid hematoma, which was led to a traumatic brain injury. You know, breaks in her spine and in her sinus cavity mm -hmm. and everything. It was it was a disaster. But it was it wasn't anything you could see. Yeah. So walking around, guy with a a limp or a brace or now an amputation. You know. <laughs> yeah. What and it ends up being that people often associate, you know, a, a much more severe trauma with a physical injury. So that yeah. that was a huge hurdle for us to get over yeah. as a couple and individually. Yeah. And understanding each other's, you know, things that we what had to go through. Yeah. 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 Individually and together. Yeah. 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 And, um, it took a lot of. Um, work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it still yeah, does. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's it's a constant, it, you know, there's yeah. always things to work on and things to work together on. Yeah. yeah, but it also kind of put into perspective for us, like there are certain things in life that happen that seem like a big deal, um, but you can choose whether you want that to be a part of your life or not. And it's, it, we just took a step back with some of the things some people would say to us and we're like, okay, yeah. does it really have to be a part of our life? Does it really matter? And we were able, it actually helped us. I don't know that we would have been able to move past some of some things that like um, outside of the accident that happened um, with like things people would say or like the, just the drama of trying to like move from dating to marriage um, yes. <laughs> without yeah. going Which through in something. normal circumstances, so big. this is a really big yeah. deal. <laughs> so let's pull them up without, yeah. Right, so, so. so you, you like officially kind of started going out in February of 2016. Yep. Yes. Yeah. And you went on this trip in yep. July. Yeah, so we left was this on the July first, 2nd. Was this like the first big trip that you guys yeah. did yeah. together? Yeah, yeah it and was. it was actually the first time I ever rode on a motorcycle. Yeah, wow. so yeah. it was. Uh, so we left July 2nd, so, and so I had been riding. So let's just go back a little bit, because mm -hmm. Dad's here. Yeah, sure. <laughs> you guys are going on the first <laughs> big trip as a couple, mm -hmm. and you've never ridden motorcycles before. Yeah. You have. Yeah, I had been riding since I was 16. <laughs> okay, yeah. and so Dad starts thinking about what? Terrifying. Yeah. <laughs> and, and like Molly. You're really not going to go on that motorcycle. Well, yeah, the original plan was it was a larger group, and you were actually going to be most of the time in a car. Yeah. The yeah. Group and then pared Joe. down to the point where it was just three of you on motorcycles, yep. you two together on one. Yeah. But yeah. what really made me feel good is that Ben had such a concern about personal protective gear, and when mm. you're going on trips like this, you're taking a risk, just like surfing is a risk. I mean. Every day we step outside, there's yeah. a risk, but yeah. mm -hmm. you made sure that you had the best gear. In the middle of July, you were wearing full, you know, leather jackets and gloves. Yeah. Yep. And you made sure that you spent a little bit more to get the best helmet. Yeah. yeah. And well, that would probably Which was ultimately the ended up saving Molly's life. Yeah. Yeah. Because, yeah. Well, yeah um, when we were first looking at helmets, I was going to get a full face helmet, but it was a little bit cheaper than the one I ended up getting. And every time I tried it on, I was like, it's hurting my jaw. I don't know if I can sit on a bike for like five hours at a time wearing yeah. this helmet. Mm -hmm. And I tried on the more expensive, nicer one, and it didn't hurt my face um, at all. And I was comfortable. I was like, okay, I'm just gonna spend the extra money yeah. and get it. And if I hadn't bought that specific helmet, like I would not be alive. The other one was wow. fine, but this, the helmet, it was, like really, I don't remember the details of it, but it was thicker and it was like stronger. It was yeah. like uh, higher it, rated, yeah. and it still cracked from here to like it the back. Has yeah, a big hole in it. yeah, yeah. It's, still have we it. saved yeah. everything. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> this was toward the tail end of their trip when it happened. Yeah. Actually, it was the last day. It was last yeah. day you were yeah. on your way back, and and by then I was comfortable because my biggest yeah, of course, worry was we had gone through the busy, everyone's you know, worry. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. First couple days of the trip, right. you're like, yeah. oh. Honestly. When I get the phone call, I was home. It was summer, and mm -hmm. I work in a school. I was doing summer school, and I came home, and 
when the accident happened, I didn't feel good that day. And I went home. I said, I'm just going to lay down. I called you and said, oh, my head hurts. It was really yeah. strange. And um, I got a phone call on my cell phone, and it was one of those unknown callers. And I'm like, oh, this is spam or whatever. And Did I didn't, you answer it? I didn't. Mm. I didn't answer it. And then I they called. They left a voicemail, and I said, wow, these people are really getting aggressive. <laughs> so I listened to the voicemail, and it, it was a doctor in mm. Canada. And I didn't even think accident. I thought, oh, Molly, maybe she is not feeling well, has a sinus infection, stopped somewhere, needs my health card, or blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and um, so I s called the guy back, still thinking, oh, like nothing yeah. really happened. And then he started explaining, and I wasn't really comprehending it because mm. I still hadn't gone there yeah. with what was really going yeah. on. And then finally, I was like, wait a minute, wait a minute. And then he was and listing. what did he tell you? He was listing. Um, he said, your daughter's been in a motorcycle accident. And he immediately listed every single injury she had. And it was long. <laughs> yeah. It was long. And then all I could think of was she was riding with Ben. Mm -hmm. And I said, OK, she's alive. And he's like, yeah, she's alive. But we're going to have to transport her, uh, air back her to Halifax. And I said, okay. And I said, she was riding with someone else. Is he okay? And they wouldn't say anything. And I said, listen, I don't really care about any privacy laws. Yeah. You need to tell me now if he's alive. <laughs> yeah. And they said, well, we're just going to put it this way. He's in just as bad as condition. Okay. So I said, fine, if you're going to medvac her, medvac her to the United States. Yeah. And they refused. And I said, well... If you're medvacking her, I really want her in close to us in Boston. And he said, nope, we won't do that because we're, we wouldn't be guaranteed that we would be paid. Oh and I, right then my heart sunk because I didn't have a passport wow. myself. Mm -hmm. I didn't know how I was going to get there. And I really wanted her in Boston, of like course. in this area. Of course. And I thought, this is all because you're worried about getting paid. I'm like, I can guarantee you'll get paid. And <laughs> they absolutely refused. And so they said, we will get in touch with you as soon as she gets to um, Halifax, mm -hmm. to, to um, the Queen Elizabeth II, yeah. I believe it was. Yeah. So after that, obviously, I was panicked and tried to call you, but called my oldest daughter by accident. <laughs> and, and then it just, it just went on from there. But, yeah. Yeah. So obviously, I so. said, well, I'll have to get oh, this. Here we go. I'll call it text, back. It's a two-text limit. Now it's a one-text limit. <laughs> right. The second one, I was like, yeah. I've got to call you back. So, yeah. um, and my little a, sister was actually, um, Ben and I worked at the golf club together first. And we got Mercedes um, a job at the golf club for like the following year. So while we were on the trip, she was working there and she, they had to call her out of, um, it's called the grill room, the sir, the dinner room and like send her home. And she had no idea what was going on. Yeah. And you, when did you guys tell her? Um, after she got home, we, we had actually already left because I was panicked because neither of us had passports. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I couldn't book a flight. Yeah. Yeah. So I was like, yeah. we're going to drive. And so, um, amazingly, they actually found out who you were through the consulate, yeah. and the consulate called me, the American consulate yeah. called me, and said, I said, I'm really panicked, I, I have to get there, and he said, fine, there's a, ports, there's a passport authority near you in Portsmouth, if you go, we can get you a passport within an hour. Oh, wow. So they wow. expedited it within an hour, we were already in the car, sitting up there waiting for it to be processed, and we drove through the night yeah. Yeah. to get yeah. there. Halifax. And you went to Halifax. So, yeah. so what so, was the last thing that you guys remember oh before man. this happened? The last thing I remember from that day is um, that so you guys, morning. This, you guys, this is the final leg of your trip. Yeah, yeah. you got up in the morning. Yeah. Well, I ready to go. Yeah, I remember getting up, and we stopped for breakfast that morning. And the last thing I remember is my nana sending me a message on Facebook asking when we were going to be home. And yeah. I said, "Oh, we're about to get back on the Even bike. Later. We'll be home really soon." I don't remember anything yeah. else and really we, until. We were back. Yeah, in the we US. left for the we left in the morning at like nine forty, yeah. nine thirty, and it was a beautiful day, and it was all back roads for the yeah. whole way, so it was a nice easy ride. And then that's like it's all blank, and there's mm -hmm. very little like flashbulb memories of things that yeah. like um, all I remember house. from the accident is is feeling like wet, like I was um, like in water, and then being loaded into the into an ambulance, having no idea what was going on, yeah. um, and asking for Molly, and had the EMT that was in the ambulance was like, oh, who's Molly? And I remember freaking out, like, what do you mean, who's Molly? She's yeah. my passenger, she's on the back of my bike, like, where is she? Yeah. 
And she had been transported in another, I don't I think, was I think you were flown, they flown, they flown yeah, um, to Cape Breton Regional. And when we got there, they basically turned us away because so they, they, had, they were like, there's no way we can, <laughs> we don't have um, the, the capacity. Yeah. Um, so the, the whole, everything about the accident is a total blur for both of us. This yeah. is crazy. And then when did and you find out what happened actually? We still, we're still kind of in the dark and it's yeah. been over three years and we're still dealing with lawyers in Canada and yeah. trying to deal with insurance companies yes. and everything. All of a sudden pictures of just so yeah, so we, after three just, and a half just years. Just it's been more yeah. information. It's been a very, very challenging yeah, it was a, ordeal. Yeah, it's, yeah, we, um, it's been a really long haul just to get any information yeah. on anything and a lot of it is um, incomplete information yeah, and that uh, just fell by the wayside. Yeah. And it started um, out with a lot of like speculation. So we had a couple witness statements that didn't line up with the police report. And then we had the police report kept changing. a different police report come mm -hmm. through. And then we got this paperwork that was like 40 pages and all of it was just redacted. It's just and blank. We had been and traveling with two other people, but they had left us behind. So they um, didn't even know. They, no, they didn't, they didn't even know. Didn't even they, know. They, they showed up at the hospital when we got transferred to Halifax? Halifax, yeah. So they didn't even go to Cape Breton. Like they, yeah. we, it was so so quick. So yeah. they stayed somewhere overnight, and the next day they came to Halifax, and they were in the room. Yeah. And they said we didn't even. We thought they said we thought you guys broke down. Yeah. Like we thought you ran out of gas or something, and they were so far away. By the time they stopped, when we didn't, when we finally didn't show up, and yeah. like they didn't receive a phone call or anything, they were like, okay, let's go back, make sure everything's okay. Totally not, yeah. want, not knowing they were gonna roll up on an accident. Yeah. yeah. And um, by the time they got back, we were already being loaded up yeah. with the EMTs. So it yeah. had, you know, quite a bit of time had passed before right. yeah. they even came back. Yeah, mm -hmm. so we don't really have any information. Yeah, no. so in the dark. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it was <laughs> the- We know it was a head on collision. Yeah. It was really, it's been, it was really challenging being in Canada and not being able to get back home. Was right. when we were in Halifax, yeah. we so Molly's cousin works for he worked, Harvard. No, no, he he was he was he's in the medical field in Boston. I, I believe he was working for Brigham's. Yeah. Um, yeah, at the time. Um, yeah. yeah. Okay. So he actually came up with my parents, and because we weren't able to get a med flight. Um, yeah, we, through insurance. He, he said, I'll go up because oh, yeah. you need me up yeah. there. Yeah. Yeah. And we he, did um, need him. <laughs> he kind of talked to the doctors and got things set so that if he could secure a flight for us, nothing, it, the doctors in Boston could handle everything. Yeah. Um, so like he got an external fixator on Ben's leg. Um, he got them to postpone a couple of surgeries they were planning for me. Well, yeah, that was and, the biggest thing, is yeah. that we, there was there was this laundry list of surgeries that they wanted to perform. And when he came up, he was like, no, 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 stop everything, mm -hmm. not doing it here. Um, so we talked to the insurance company to try to get a med flight for both of us to get home. Yeah. And they denied it because they said, oh no, if, if you're in Canada, it's comparable healthcare and we're not gonna pay for it. Yeah. You're just gonna have to do what they say and stay there and figure it out until you can get yourselves back home. And you also were waiting because they didn't have an orthopedic team. Yeah, so they I, had no I was, orthopedic just, team. was just in a quad, so in a quad room. Days, so, so yeah, yeah. yeah. For anything came to back, happen. yeah. And um, so the only way to get back was to be flown on like a special fixed wing craft because yeah. Molly, was just out of the coma, they, but still yeah. like, yeah. Yeah, and, part of it, so yeah. 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 broken yeah. ribs, yeah. punctured lungs. Okay, oh, okay. All right. so, so you can go first. All right, so <laughs> it's a long list. Uh, so I had, I, from the bottom up, broke every toe bone, like all my toes, broke my left ankle, broke my right ankle um, in two places. I had two fractures in my tibia, one in my fibula, I had basically a p powdered kneecap, um, so my patella was like crushed. I had a lot of damage to the tissue around it, three compound fractures in my right femur, um, dislocated hip, compression fracture in L1, both punctured lungs, lacerated spleen, and that's it. But, yeah. it, but he wasn't in ICU. But no. No, but he was in, in a ICU. room was, with uh, four people. Into, yeah, into a quad room was, where like, it, it, we were separated by cloth curtains <laughs> and the guy next to me was like screaming all day and night. Yeah. And it, was, it was awful. Yeah. Um, so that was mine. Yeah, I had um, various breaks in both my feet, um, a double compound fracture in my right ankle, um, 
three breaks in my left sacrum and one through my left hip joint. Um, I had uh, ribs one through four on the right side were broken and two actually swung down and punctured my lung. Um, I broke uh, C1 and C2 and then, um, oh yeah, my, yeah, my right scapula, which I found out no one breaks that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I shattered my nose and my right sinus and I had a subarachnoid hematoma on my left frontal yeah, we lobe. Found out six months later you actually broke your jaw. Yeah. Oh yeah, and they didn't catch that. Um, my jaw locked six months later and they realized it was from scar tissue. Yeah. Um, oh cause God. it had, and I was, cause I wasn't conscious so I didn't complain about it. So like it got overlooked. Um, you also and paralyzed vocal cords. Yeah, oh. for a and short period of time. And I lost, lost my sense of smell, smell because like when I had the traumatic brain injury, my olfactory nerves were severed and they just didn't grow back. Yeah. So you still can't. Still. No. Yeah. You had wow. The irony of a chef <laughs> and a chef's know, wife. Right? Yeah. <laughs> you had to go back for a oh, oh, yeah. yeah so so um, in Canada, they left a stitch in my nose from the uh, intubator and it created dead cartilage and it hurt and I had to have uh, it removed later. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So you, how did you eventually get that air vac out? So, yeah, uh, do you want to tell her? Sure. Uh, no, it was, uh, it was your, um, your teachers. So um, a couple of my teachers from the middle school in Hampton, here in Hampton, uh, created a GoFundMe and the town blasted it out. Um, a lot of local business owners really pushed it. Can I um, add to that? Yeah, of course. So, this happened because we were in the hotel room one night after we had to leave the um, hospital between certain hours. Mm -hmm. You couldn't be there because she was in ICU. So you had to leave for like two and a half hour period, I think it was, remember? Mm -hmm. And so I was back in the hotel room and I was trying to message one of my coworkers and I accidentally, I didn't even realize at the time that you could FaceTime on Messenger. Mm -hmm. um, and so I hit one of the teachers that I work with and she was like, Jackie, what's going on? And I was like, oh my gosh. And so I told good. them and they're like, okay, we're, so you know, we're gonna try and figure this out. And I was like, what do you mean? And so then that's when they came Because yeah, so I told them about the med flight and it was about 30, I think well, it was $36,000 yeah, um, to yeah. get them to yeah. right. the States. So, yeah. Yeah. Right. so and we, um, the town stepped this. up. Yeah, and so, yeah, the town stepped up. Um, where we worked at the Golf Club of New England, yeah. they stepped up, they donated a ton of money. Well, it was incredible. Um, and there were people coming out of the woodworks like that we didn't even know but knew what had happened yeah. or like really small connections to other people there and were, it ended up. There were people that I like met one once when I went to school in Tampa that yeah. donated, wow. looking through the list, yeah, it, it was, was incredible. Huge. And I, um, I remember sitting in the hospital bed, I think we ended up pushing our, we were we were together one of the days the that they brought, hospital, but yeah, that's right, yeah. and we were watching um, all of this, you know, activity happening on the, the GoFundMe, like it was incredible, yeah. people, every like, 10 minutes there was a new person that was. Wow. And yeah, and they actually managed to raise enough money to bring us home in 24 hours. Yeah, so and it was so. a $36,000 med flight. Med flight. Mm -hmm. The GoFundMe raised over 40,000 in a day. Yeah. And so the next day, or two days later, yeah, we had to, they, we had had to, to, we had to figure out getting the plane there yeah. and how to get us to the plane. Yeah. On this trip, they've been planning all summer for it and looking forward to it. Just a vacation at the end of the summer, Molly going back to school and you know, you guys, really ramping up in your relationship, which mm -hmm. we knew, we knew it was the right one. Oh. We knew you So you guys, you guys like Ben? We like Ben. They talk. Okay, yeah. good. Yeah, that's, <laughs> we like Ben a lot. We get along. <laughs> he was almost too good at basketball for me. Oh, please, oh. you know that's a lie. That's a total lie. I shoot over the hoop, it's, it's not good. But we really didn't know it, and it's funny because the first time we met you was on Molly's birthday when we were out in yeah. Portsmouth up at Reraz, and you said, oh, this guy I work with, Ben, is going to show up here. And it's well, funny because when you showed up and we were talking, your older sister, Kylie, texted all of us in the group family chat is, why are these two not dating? <laughs> <laughs> wow. But yep. I think the thing I remember most after the accident uh, and when we arrived there, and I knew you were going to feel horrible. You were just feeling so guilty. And I said, oh, yeah, it's not your awful. fault, Ben. It's not yeah. your fault. If anything, you know, I think the steps that you took to try to be safe and, and ride properly yeah. uh, save both of your lives. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it was it was it was crazy. We totally. had we had planned like this whole thing to go it was uh, 12 days of travel. So we from New Hampshire, we went all the way to Newfoundland mm. on a motorcycle. Yeah. So it was like 2000 mile ride. 
Um, we was it involved getting on a ferry with the bikes, staying in we really had, weird bed and breakfasts. Yeah, yeah. We actually ended up in PEI <laughs> yeah, for we went a to couple Prince of days. Island. Like that wasn't even Beautiful. planned. Beautiful, It happened unplanned, to be yeah. their first ever um, motorcycle rally. Yeah, there was a rally that we got to participate really cool, in, which those people end up be like donating to yeah. the GoFundMe yeah. in the end. Yeah, and yeah. They ended up helping yeah. us out, which yeah. was nice. So it was a really, really you know well planned, well thought out trip. We had a cabin to stay in when we yeah. got to Newfoundland. We saw icebergs for the first time ever. Yeah. Um, almost got to, got to visit. Axes. Yeah, I got to th throw axes. <laughs> Saw like the old Viking sites that are up there. It was really, really yeah, cool. It was awesome. And um, it was a lot of, you know, like we had talked about earlier was the, the, the worry was in the first part of the trip. You know, we had two um, back to back full day travels mm -hmm. to get to where we were going. Mm -hmm. And it was like always nerve wracking to be on the road and super, yeah. super cautious. And we were cautious the whole time, yeah. but you start to like, uh, everyone was kind of like, okay, this is good. It's, yeah. it's all set. You know, it was our last day. We're like, yep, we're heading home. Yeah. You know, it really, we it was fun, it. but we're happy. We're going to be happy to be back. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And yeah. yeah, it was crazy. It just, um, it, it, and it, it changes in an instant. Like, yeah. Yeah. So. yeah. Everything. Oh. So when you got back, you guys got the medevac to Boston. Yes. And uh, you were sharing a little bit the other day. Uh, you guys were separated. Yes. yes. In the hospital, right? Yeah. I so was Molly, in the ICU. Yeah. And you were in. I was in just a just a dual room. Yeah. So they had they had the yeah they had uh, they had big rooms that were meant for two people. I just happened to have one that was just my bed, which was nice. It was <laughs> it was good to be. Nice alone. change from um, what you had Yeah, just exactly. Left. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I was on a different floor, I think. Right. Oh, in, in, at Brigham. Yeah, Brigham. Uh, no, you were down the hall. Molly was in ICU still. Okay. They transferred her into ICU. So, so talk talk yeah. about that a little bit. Yeah. So yeah. where where were you and and um, you know what were they telling you or not? Yeah, of course. You about so when when you, when, you when it all first happened, um, they keep ev they keep everything in the dark. Like they you know you know about what's happening with you and that's it. Yeah. Um, and even then, that's a stretch. But I was asking so many questions of them and eventually was just like, all right, well, just bring me down there so I can see her and like have a chance to talk with her. And they're like, oh no, no, you know, she's, we can't do that and on and on. And the next day, two day, or it was two days in a row, I was kept asking like, can you please bring my bed down there? I like want to see her. I swear I'm going to walk myself down there with all these cords and medical equipment. And um, so they finally, they did, but to, in prepping me for getting down there, I had, <laughs> so the conversation started with the doctors talking about how Molly was in a coma. She'd had a really bad traumatic brain injury with really intense swelling on her brain. Weren't really sure how it was going to go down. Um, and that it was possible that at the end of this, after her recovery was over, she would, wouldn't be that high functioning and she might have a lot of issues that were really challenging to get through and to like, you know, evaluate what we were gonna what we were gonna do with our lives. Mm -hmm. And then as they got me ready for transport to go down to bring my bed to Molly's room, I had a panic attack and went into tachycardia. And so they had to wait until I calmed down <laughs> enough to I get to get down there. Yeah, they thought I was gonna have a heart attack. In the bed, they were rolling yeah. his bed and, and my and my the machine so was like long. going crazy. They thought he was having a heart attack. Yeah. So to to signify the moment, uh, we we got our EKGs from Canada just as a breakaway from when when we finally got home. They sent all of our paperwork down to us. So we as soon as Molly could drive, we went to a tattoo shop in <laughs> Portsmouth. Yep, and we got tattoos. So I got Molly's heartbeat from when she was in the coma and her handwriting. It says I'd die for you, and then she got my heartbeat from when I was in tachycardia and my handwriting. It says I live for you. <laughs> So it was, it was, it, it was worth it. No, no. Um, but uh, yeah, the, the the experience of getting around in the hospitals was really, yeah. really challenging. Especially not being able to walk or even go anywhere in a wheelchair. So we were both yeah. non weight bearing yeah. for three months. And uh, when I first was like cognitive, um, I. At first, I thought I was 16, so I had lost like six years of my life, right. and. Um, I, when I started regaining memories, I couldn't tell if they were dreams, if they had been dreams, or if, um, if they were real. And I started questioning whether Ben was yeah. real. So I actually made my, I had lost my phone in the accident. I made my parents give me their phone so I could call Ben yeah. to know if he was real. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, it was a cute conversation. Was, yeah, that was one of She also uh, had paralyzed vocal cord and like, it was like talking, <laughs> whisper. 
it was it was funny. Yeah, but, but um, it was weird. It was weird for me waking up and um, trying to understand what was going on. At one point, my sisters came to visit, and um, Kylie and Mercedes were standing at my bedside, and they, um, I opened my eyes and I said, Mercedes, what are you doing here? Weren't you just in a horrible accident? And they mm. looked at each other and laughed, and then they looked back at me, and then they looked back at each other and just started bawling. <laughs> and it was just, yeah. yeah, and yeah, um, it was just really weird. It was very disorienting when I first woke up and for a very long time, like it's beyond, um, I mean, with a traumatic brain injury, it's confusing anyways. And it's hard to kind of get your bearings of where you are, who you are, what's going on, make sure you understand everything. And then that's compounded by from the moment I woke up to even now, I still hear sometimes people talk about people with traumatic brain injuries in a way it's almost like dehumanizing or almost yeah. like no matter what you do, there's a judgment on, oh, it's got to be related to their brain injury. If they don't like what you have to say, it's easy to minimize it. Yeah. If they um, if they don't like the way you're behaving, oh, they've never been the same since the head injury. Yeah. And for a long time, I struggled with the um, trying to figure out if the way I was behaving was something I really felt or if I um, was actually not the same person. Mm. And, and we've, there wasn't a lot of resources to go and— you know, not, not a lot of people to talk to to try yeah. to figure it out because brain injury is still so foreign to a lot of yeah. people. Physical injury, it's great. I can see it. I can touch it. I can take care of it. Yeah. Brain injury, yeah, you can only I mean, see so far into someone's brain. I mean, we, yeah. technology has advanced a lot. But. Yeah, because they told me I should be prepared to not be able to go back to school. Um, they said I... Sorry. It's okay. That's okay. Okay. Um, it's kind of fitting. <laughs> <laughs> they, they said I might not be able to go back to school. Um, they said they weren't sure how much of my, like, um, <laughs> no, they said they didn't know if I was going to be able to go back to school. They didn't know how much I'd be able to process. Yeah, um, yeah cognitive and, functions. Yeah, my cognitive functions. Yeah. Um, she had to go through um, really extensive therapy. Yeah, I so, well, it was weird because when I was discharged from the hospital, something got lost in translation between Canada and Boston, and I wasn't given a neurologist. Um, and I had just suffered a severe traumatic brain injury, and so I was kind of navigating the world and trying to figure it out on my own, not realizing that something wasn't right. right. And about six months, uh, my six month checkup with my orthopedic surgeon at Brigham, we said to him, should I have a neurologist because I'm having severe migraines, like I'm having word recall issues, like I just don't know if that's normal. And he, his face like went white and he was like, you don't have a neurologist. Yeah. And so he set up an appointment for me with um, somebody in Foxborough. Um, Massachusetts, and he's supposed to be a great neurologist. And we get down there. Um, it took three months to get in with him. When we got there, so turns this is nine months later. Yeah, yeah. Yes. turns yes. out he was not the kind of neurologist I needed. He does like, like skin, yeah. um, and so he was confused for why I was there. And, and yeah. he was like, "Okay, I'm gonna send you to somebody for brain injuries." And so they set me up with somebody in Jamaica Plain in Boston, and that took me three more months to get into. And I get yeah. there, and I sit down, and the man comes in the room, and he says, so I deal with post-concussion syndrome. I yeah. cannot help you. Because this, <laughs> this was July. This was the following July yeah. by now. So, so it was almost we a full about, year. Yeah. We were about a year out from by. the accident. From lack of trying. Yeah. No, and at this point, like, I was still going to the emergency room regularly from such severe swings and migraines that I'd be, like, throwing up or, like, I couldn't function. Um, and so... He set me up with a neurologist at Spalding Rehabilitation Hospital, and it took me about another two months to get in with her. Yeah. And then when I met with her, she knew what she was doing. <laughs> she was the right one. And she set me up with a neuropsychologist, which I should have seen way, way long, long ago. Then, yeah. But that took me six months to get in with. Yeah. So I finally met with her and took yeah. the neuropsych test and then was able to get like my therapy all set up. And I had already gone back to school at that point. Yeah, but it wasn't, <laughs> so it wasn't until the beginning, on my own, but beginning it was of 2018. Graduated. So yeah. accident, <laughs> middle of 2016, therapy finally starting February 2018. Yeah. It was ridiculous. Yeah, right. and um, so that was, that was really difficult. I mean, my... My symptoms kind of 
dissipated on their own, but it would have been nice to have like that help yeah. with like the um, word recall. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 perfect example. That with the health healthcare. Um, what I noticed along the way is everywhere you were, they were eager to get you out. Yeah. Mm. Um, even uh, Brigham. Yeah. I mean, yeah, and it was... they were using a net to pick her up out of bed. They moved her from ICU, finally, mm -hmm. to a room. And then as soon as she got in that room, all I kept hearing was, we need, we need room, we need, we need room in this room, we need, we need to put another patient in. And they would use those big nets because she had broken, like, everything right. in her sacrum. And they, they, I remember them doing that to you. And then mm -hmm. I remember finding out the next day that they were sending you to rehab. And I was like, how yeah. is this even possible right. yeah. with right. all the things that you had? So every step along the way, and then even at rehab, mm -hmm. um, Molly was using, uh, she couldn't walk obviously, and she was in a wheelchair, so she used a thing called the transfer board. Mm -hmm. And I mean, day one, they had her going on that transfer board, and it was great because Molly's, you know, a go-getter. Yeah. She'll do what you tell her. Yeah, yeah and she'll do it. Yeah. Very athletic, you know, yeah. always was, you know. So, of course, she did it, and they were, like, amazed. And then they wanted to discharge her out of there, and they were they would bring her down to the car before they would discharge her and put you know have, see how she could transfer into the car well she couldn't right. and they were literally the literally pushing that. her and she, i remember getting so upset that yeah. day because i had had enough yeah. she actually and started pulling on my clothes to try and drag me up just, to the transfer board and i was yeah. like this hurts you out so someone else can have yeah. this bed yeah. yeah and um i actually ended up i had a van at the time and because because it went yeah. up. I actually went and rented a car yeah. so it could be the same because they wanted her out of there so right. bad. Right. Yeah. And it, and you know. <coughs> and it was and still. Also, I think that was one of the scariest parts about, um, for me, for my specific injuries with dealing with the medical system is when I was in, not only the getting transferred out of each hospital super quickly physically, but mentally they had me um, in the rehab hospital meeting with a specialist who was supposed to see if I was doing okay. And that was actually a huge part of the reason I never got a neurologist because I don't remember taking any of these tests. I don't remember the rehab hospital really until the last couple of days I was there. And they had given me a test and I had passed everything, but I don't remember well, Extraordinarily, like yeah, you. Yeah, and so yeah. They, they were testing things like my ability to read a list of colors and say the color it was instead of the color it says. Mm. And I was like so determined that I just right. did it all. Um, and so they discharged me from everything and I was not anywhere near where, where I should have yeah. been. So it, that really came, the the how big of a deal that was really came to light when I finally w met with the neuropsych doctor and she did the testing and she's at the end she said you know you did fine you hit average at least on everything she's like but I don't think that's where you started exactly she's mm -hmm. like and you deserve to continue to get treatment right. Right. she's like just be like you deserve to get back to where you were not yeah. the baseline not a, yeah not average. so with everything that you guys went through you started a nonprofit. yes yeah. When did you start the nonprofit, and what what did you what did you want to do with it, or what have um, you done with it? So we, we were super gung ho. Yeah, we were, when very we were in the wheelchairs. And yeah, we started, we started in October. Two thousand twentieth, two thousand sixteen. Yes. Um, Just in, we incorporated and we had our like our October two thousand sixteen. Yeah, like, so three or four months. Three months later. Yeah. yeah. Oh boy. Yeah. So, so, we didn't have enough going on. Exactly. Got um, it. Yeah. I think and, because of everything you well, felt like. Well, there was you a lot. Through. Yeah, yeah, there was a lot we started to see. Like there were certain pieces of medical equipment that we couldn't get. Yeah. Or you for, could leave with with crutches, but you can't have a wheelchair. Or you you know, or and you, it's it, yeah, you have to weigh a certain amount to get. Yeah, to get specific equipment for your. Tell me what happened. Yeah. So I. Because I was using a transfer board to get to one surface to another, you, see, you have to use like a board that's like this wide and this long, mm -hmm. and just I like had to yeah, you shimmy on, on it. Rehab, yeah. So, so they didn't want you to have any yeah. because they wanted me to go. Said you could go one. buy one. <laughs> so the problem that arise arose with that is that when I needed to go to the bathroom. I needed a surface that the board could sit on so I could transfer over to the toilet, and so I basically needed a geriatric commode and when they put in for one at the rehab hospital, insurance came back and said no, because I didn't weigh enough. It yeah. didn't matter that I wouldn't be able to get yeah. so the, to use the bathroom without it. It was just because I didn't weigh enough the and standard, I was too young. Yeah, the standard cover 
wasn't wide enough for a transfer board to sit on and sit on the wheelchair. So mm-hmm. there was no, ro- like you couldn't start moving over because one side would fall. Yeah. So she, the, the larger sized up was set for set for geriatric mm-hmm. and, or bariatric, sorry. Oh, and was it, it bariatric? Yeah, it was, so it, there was a weight sorry. restriction to it. Got so it was it. like super heavy duty um, and she didn't meet the requirements for it, so insurance said, nope, you don't weigh enough, like we're not gonna supply so totally that. totally arbitrary decisions being made by a stranger Ridiculous. because of rules in a book. Yes, yes exactly. Yes. Well, and the, the, the way insurance works got even more interesting as the recovery continued. Yeah, it, by the way. Um, yeah. As, as, Ben's, as Ben continued with surgeries, even more and more stuff came to light with the insurance that was so confusing and so difficult to deal mm-hmm. with and seemed so arbitrary. And so, like, somebody who's not a doctor, who's not a professional, is making these decisions. Right. So if we kind of, like, fast forward to all of the surgeries you had. Yeah. Um, what was it, 11 surgeries? Yeah, 11 reconstructive surgeries. Trying so. to save the leg yep. from July 2016 to this just past August. Yes, yeah, just before August. Um, they did a bunch of surgeries. None of them worked. They all made it worse. Yeah. And then it finally came to the time where we had to decide, does he want to be in the hospital for six months with another surgery, or does he want to meet with a prosthetist for a prosthetic if he had an amputation mm-hmm. every couple of weeks? And so we decided... Yeah, well, we had been talking about the amputation for like a full year prior Mm -hmm. to that. I had a surgery done in Boston where they were going to do... I was under, and they were going to do a manual manipulation to try to get the leg moving again because it was frozen straight. And it had done its... It had fused itself. I had so much bone damage that the regrowth was stuck. Mm -hmm. And as they went in for the manipulation, they tore my patellar tendon off the bone and damaged my IT band. So they had to do an emergency surgery. Seven and a half hours later, wake up back in a brace system. Mm-hmm. They're like, yeah, this thing is just it's not going to work. And basically, there's nothing more we can do for you, so you're going to have to seek medical advisement somewhere else. Yeah. So we never went back to that hospital. And um, unfortunately, that led to a lot of other surgeries and trying to correct certain things that ended up making something else worse. And then I had really horrible arthritis that started to get... And I and all this time, we had both been denied Social Security. Mm-hmm. And I had gone for a second time to try to, I was unable to work completely, not just by like, there was so, there was so many factors, pain, being in the hospital, being bedridden. And I was like, we need, yeah, we need something. I had, I had developed an opiate addiction right when the accident first happened, was on massive amounts of painkillers that were completely unnecessary. Mm -hmm. And I lost 60 pounds over the course of three months from that. And I, it, I, when I had the amputation, I only took Tylenol after it. And my recovery, I was out of the hospital in two days. Yeah. Like, I mean, they, they pushed a lot of that was actually, yeah. 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 That was, Always. Yeah. That was actually really scary, too, going from one hospital to the rehab hospital to visiting with his PCP after the accident is there was zero communication yeah. on the medications, and so everyone was okay with doubling yeah. it. Yeah, so one, one said, oh, well, the reason you're still in pain is because it's not strong enough, so they gave me a stronger dose. I mean, and then the next you said, oh. one night and you were in pain, and the nurse was yelling at you oh, yeah. to take more yeah. medicine. So we, they had given me they had given me a dose still in pain was talking about it what was but was trying to express like I don't want to keep taking all of this medication because I know I'm supposed to stop taking it at some point and I believe Did what you she know said how was addictive it was oh uh, yeah but not no, not you, in the you way didn't of know when you took it so bad well you no knew I, I knew it it I knew it would be just from the everyone yeah, stereotype yeah. of yeah, knowing, yeah, yeah. you know, yeah. drugs are addictive. Ben had never had, like, a serious injury. Right, before. so I'd never been, was, on, been, never been on painkillers um, before. Like, I had had surgeries from, like, sports injuries growing up, and I knew, like, painkillers, I don't do well on them. Yeah. I get really sick, so yeah. I didn't take anything. And Ben just, he was just, he had never even been prescribed a painkiller before, yep. so it was brand new to him. And... Not only did they keep doubling his dosage, but then they regimented it. Well, yeah, and so everyone that's what kept saying. saying it went from yeah. it went from you need a stronger dose to the next person saying, well, you need to take it more often. To the next person saying, well, you need to take it at these exact times every day and make sure you're getting ahead of the pain, yeah. which is awful. And wow. I and remember saying to Ben one day, why do you want to get ahead of the pain? How will you ever know if you're any better? Right. And the his his PCP just didn't want to hear it. 
I just wanted him to take the medicine. Yeah, because it was easy to just keep prescribing the medication and just, okay, just go away and be quiet now. Do you remember and what it was? What it, kind? Oh, yeah. So <laughs> I was on oxycodone, oxycontin, gabapentin. Dilaudid. Dilaudid. Valium. Were you on a muscle relaxer? And Valium. Oh, yeah. And... Um, we ha I had a oh, I had an oral form of morphine if it, if it got to that point, yeah. which <laughs> if it got to that point, yeah, <laughs> <They're all> beyond <laughs> everything else. Wow. Um, I mean, everybody knows I, I used now to, the opioid crisis. Used, yeah, but at the, at the time, time you're just kind of like living through it. Well, yeah, to our bag, a bag because like we we don't take anything. Right. Yeah, yeah bag, I mean, right. we take a Tylenol. It's a big yeah. deal. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, prescription bottles and and you know pill containers and everything. It was ridiculous. Yeah. So. um Stopped one day, cold turkey in the middle of the day, went to the emergency room that night um, in really, really horrible intestinal pain. And the doctor was like, yeah, you're just, this is classic withdrawal symptoms. Wow. Just gonna have to either wait it out or go back on it and wean yourself off. So mm -hmm. 10 days of your stereotypical, horrible night sweats, can't sleep, but always tired in intense pain. Yeah. And then almost a full year until I finally recovered from intestinal problems. Yeah. yeah. And um, it was it was a disaster. I've only, you know, and it took a long time to gain the weight back that I had lost. Yeah. I had been a weightlifter before we left on the, the trip and yeah. I was all gone, all the muscle mass you and lost, everything. lost, 60 pounds? Yeah, 60 pounds. Mm. Between so it was, the day of the accident and yeah. finally coming off all the medication. So, yeah, it was a mess. So the, the, the um, non-profit idea followed immediately after yeah, right. my recovery from all of that. Yeah, so I wanted to get back to that. Yeah, no. um, because we wanted to develop something that could help people who had been in traumatic accidents and ha were unable to get proper medical equipment, so our intention was to be able to raise money to buy wheelchairs, crutches, walkers, yeah. toilet seats, yeah. shower seats, um, anything that somebody, you know, was a necessity that was unfortunately looked at by an insurance company as unessential. Yeah. yeah. And uh, we did a fundraiser the following year. Yeah. We raised a good amount of money to actually, sure. we donated to an individual who was in an accident mm -hmm. um, to try to help with some medical bills and things like yeah. that. And it, it's awesome. We put it on hold in 2000. 17 yeah, the end of 2017. that's when we realized Ben's surgeries were getting more and more aggressive yeah. and we kind of had to focus completely on that. So it's still it's still there. We're just going to restructure in the yeah. near future and like revamp it again. Yeah, so our, our, our intention is to take it from um, what was just a very haphazard mismatch of ideas uh, <laughs> when we first started it into something that we can use for public speaking yeah. as well as doing donations for, uh, we still we still very, very important want to focus on um, getting medical equipment for people if we can, yeah. but there's another business that we're gonna work with that does that yep. uh, called Crutches for Africa mm -hmm. that has massive amounts of, um, yeah. of medical, medical equipment, equipment that they, they, they yeah. give away. Wow. It, which is fantastic. Yeah. So and, um, we really want to. When we restructure, we're actually going to refocus it to be a little bit um, for dispersing funds, make it a little bit more concrete and a little bit easier um, into a scholarship fund for somebody who's gone through uh, school while dealing with a major medical yeah. um, issue that they've overcome, yeah. um, whether that be from a traumatic accident or like right. A, and we want to keep it op happen. open enough. Like yeah, if you're if you've been dealing with this for in it, you know, not just not just because it was a traumatic accident, but it could be anything. Yeah, know? and just because we know we saw firsthand how much of a financial burden it became. Um, De just dealing with insurance, the fact that medical is credit reporting and yeah. insurance can hold out on paying it until it goes to collection. Yeah. And um, we it's, we want to help other people who haven't had the same opportunities yeah. as everybody else because of something medical. Yeah. And yeah. we had, I mean, when this was all, when it first started, we both had great credit. And yeah. now... I mean, we <laughs> I still have medical bills that are waiting from the, the amputation and everything was well, so expensive. A good example is my first med flight from the scene to the first <laughs> hospital. Insurance fought us on for over a year claiming that if I hadn't had that first med flight, none of the subsequential expenses would have happened. I would have been dead. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so yeah, practically, <laughs> uh, you should have died at the scene. We wouldn't have to pay for this. Yeah. Um, and so that was credit, all medical's credit reporting. So we dealt with that. It got sent to collections. We finally got it paid back because we couldn't pay that out of pocket. It was. The first med flight was how much, Joe? 
18,000? Yeah, this is 18, Molly's helicopter. Yeah. Yeah. This was just from people. Cape Breton to, I mean, Cape Breton to Halifax, Halifax so. when they refused to. Yeah, and so. It was like a, like 40 minutes, right? Yeah. Not even an hour <laughs> transport. Yeah. And uh, I mean, it was so much, we learned so much. Like um, for me, I was kind of lucky in the sense that I was able to muscle through my recovery and go back to school and get back to work. But in Ben's situation, he wasn't able to muscle through Didn't that. And, and yeah, there was so no. Yeah. When, yeah. when we were denied Social Security the first time, I was like, okay, like this is what it's set up for. I'm supposed to work hard and not want to have to be on this. But Ben didn't have an option. Yeah. And so yeah, when what was there a reason for rejecting your application? We I was rejected because my um, I didn't have enough medical evidence to <laughs> sh to prove that I required Social Security. Which through talking with a lot of other people we know who've been in serious accidents um, or had serious medical issues, they deny everybody yeah. the first time. And the only way to get around it is to get a lawyer. Yep. Yeah. It's because I applied for a second time was also. Went through the same process. Mm -hmm. Actually, Actually if you and can't afford to get a lawyer, then you're yeah, not exactly. Right. How are you gonna yeah? How are you gonna get a lawyer to Just pay for it if you're asking if you for Social it. Security? Yeah. If you need it, yeah. then yeah. odds are you probably and don't have money yes. for a lawyer. Yeah, and yeah. it's it's scary to me. Like um, our social welfare system in the U.S. is set up to inhibit people from wanting to be on it, mm. and the. Part that is scary to me is that right before our accident, we were actually talking, Ben was talking about buying a house and I was helping him look for one. Mm -hmm. And now it's almost four years later and we're living with my parents. Yeah, and we have like nothing. Yeah. But it's, it's ridiculous because every year, <laughs> every year the deductible resets. There's a new percentage that you need to pay to all these other people who have their hand out waiting for some, some repayment. And, and I mean, thank, thank, Thankfully, when the accident happened, we were both 20, 21. Yeah. Um, so we we're, have... we're about to turn 26 this next year. And, and what do we do? He's a chef and I own a business um, and we won't have, we don't know what we're going to do for insurance yeah. yet. And yeah. it's scary. I think a lot of people our age are in that same boat, like my older sister. She didn't have anything major happen, but she's in real estate and she turned 26 a year and a half yeah. ago and had no idea what a deductible was, had no idea how to navigate the marketplace insurance. Um, and thankfully she had somebody in the medical field that she's really close with who could help her. Right. Yeah. Um, right. Yeah, but like if so you're not much as fortunate this, to... If we didn't have my cousin when the accident happened, we never would have gotten a med flight back to the U.S. Yeah. If we didn't have my family to support us after the accident took place, we would be homeless right now because we couldn't afford... We wouldn't know what to do when we got den denied Social Security. Yeah. Um, if, if, uh, like if Kylie didn't have... Salvatore, yeah. um, who's in the medical field, she wouldn't have insurance right now. Yeah. It's just, it's it's so confusing and convoluted. And the more we go through things, the more I learn about different laws that we're dealing with now, the more I'm like, why is this so incredibly complicated? Yeah. It's and almost- the thing is, If we didn't have this community, yeah. you oh, guys yeah. wouldn't yeah. have been med flighted yeah. back. Yeah. We're very, very we have it's almost such like, a great community. Uh, it's honest, it seems like, you, it's almost like you have to have a lawyer yeah. nowadays to yeah. deal with anything. Um, and it's scary. Yep. And now we're looking at um, our insurance company is, has their hand out yeah. for everything that they paid for Molly because mm -hmm. they want it paid back yeah. because it was an accident mm -hmm. and they assume she's going to be getting some money. Mm -hmm. So if she does get any money, they have they their hand out them. and it's yeah, going, yeah. I, I so, mean, I already have yeah. the bill. The yeah. U.S. From them. they're allowed to ask for Itemize. up to 100 percent of what they <laughs> and it's, paid. And it's yeah. a lot. It's a lot of money. Yeah, and, wow. and it's strange so. because we just learned this in other countries, um, like Canada, for example. If the insurance does ask for payback, if you get a settlement, they can they can only ask so for the same percentage that you got. So say you had a million dollar claim, and you only got a hundred thousand dollars the insurance company can only take 10% of what they originally asked for. Mm -hmm. In America, if you matter. get if you if you have a million dollars in medical debt and you get $5,000, the insurance is going to take all, all of, of that. It. Yep. All yeah. All of it. Yep. So, that's what and they're that's facing. Really, I mean, it sounds like at every step of the way from yeah. the moment that you asked for uh, that medevac flight mm -hmm. and they refused because they said that they didn't know they'd be paid for it mm -hmm. or not, mm -hmm. all the way to where you're at now yeah. with mm -hmm. pending legal issues yes. and insurance companies wanting money back, oh, yeah. these paybacks, mm -hmm. to trying to figure out what you both will do individually yeah. and as a couple yeah. once you turn 26. Yeah. All of this centers around, to me, really just one thing about how this healthcare system is driven by 
uh, decisions are being made, not what's in your best interest, mm -hmm. uh, but really about how they can make the most profit. Yeah. yeah. And what's crazy is if they actually, Molly actually got the help she needed from the beginning, she'd probably be in less follow-up care continuously mm -hmm. that she's in now. Right. Mm -hmm. And exactly. so right. they probably would have saved money yeah. <laughs> in the end. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. So what's the insurance looking for, 100000 Um. Yep, a okay. little bit over yeah. that. They're mm -hmm. looking for a little bit 12. more than 100000 That's just for you. For me right yeah. now. Yeah, yeah. So um, we had accrued over a million dollars over time mm -hmm. in, but in medical payments. Uh, yeah, so big, a lot of... Um, things that happened to me had to be paid through Ben's insurance up front, so thankfully my bill with my insurance isn't as big as it could be. Yep. Um, but they're looking for a little bit over $100,000 right now. And then, um, so when you turn 26, so right now, until you turn 26, you, legally, you're on your parents' insurance. Mm -hmm. um, and then the second you turn 26, you're not anymore. Um, <clears throat> which is... It gave us a chance to be entrepreneurs and work jobs that don't necessarily offer benefits, um, which I think a lot of people our age are in that position mm -hmm. right now um, in, the, in our economy of working a job without benefits. Um, but the second we turn 26, we need to figure it out. Yeah, and there's not, I mean, I'm <laughs> sure that there are resources somewhere, but they're not easily found to mm -hmm. get information on exactly what you need to be doing when you turn that, you know, when you turn well, 26. Well, true, or, because my oldest daughter yeah, who's 27, no she constantly is calling us. Yeah. Is this deductible good? Is that yeah. deductible good? Mm -hmm. yeah. How much should I be paying a month? I mean, I think she called you recently and talked to you about that, right, Joe? I believe so. Yeah. yeah. And I said, and I'm not it's sure. tough to navigate. <laughs> no, it's tough to navigate. Yeah. I mean, I, I've, yeah. I've been through this just, uh, you know, with my current job yeah. and, and when they, you know, the open enrollment season starts, you know, literally going down there and sitting with somebody who knows this stuff back to front because just getting the pamphlet of all of the different options that are available, yeah. what, is, what does it all mean? What does yeah. this percentage oh, mean, oh, that right. percentage? And really you try to look and say, okay, well, you know, like my husband and I, we're, we're pretty healthy people yeah. and try to like figure out, okay, anticipate, well, what yeah, will we need? Yeah. It's, yeah. Right, it's all right. of the deductibles and... Yeah. And uh, it's just, it's really, really, really complicated. Yeah. She was, I gotta say, she was shocked. She yeah. said, wow, I, I have to pay this a month and I have to pay this much before they'll if cover anything. Right, yeah. exactly. And yeah. she, you know, so it was shocking to her. And, and I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. I just wanna add that I have a company that I work for that was very, very supportive yeah. Yeah. and actually gave incredible. a lot yeah. and the insurance that I have with them is actually very good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just yeah. imagine if we worked for a company that didn't have good insurance. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and it's, it's. I think one of the scariest things about it is that we come from a place of relative privilege in yeah. regard to this stuff. We have yeah. access, to, uh, some access, we're not the most privileged, but we have some access to resources that have helped us along the way, and we've still struggled this yeah. much. Mm -hmm. There are so many people without, um, so many things that don't have access to family members who know the medical field, that yeah. don't have access to lawyers, that don't have access to the money to afford the medical, or don't even understand the insurance plans. Yeah. I have worked jobs where um, co managers, where I've been just like a, a cashier and my managers don't even understand like what they're choosing when they do open enrollment. That's they're right. like, oh, this one sounds good. Yeah. Well, What's interesting about that, Molly, too, is um, in talking with our attorney that is involved in this case, um, he can't even understand it. And we have to hire another attorney yeah. wow. because this is all written in the um, overall policy for the companies that they they cover. Yeah. So in order to under, it's called URSA. URSA yeah, it's, it's called URSA. URSA. And um, they have to, we have to actually pay an attorney to go through and read their pol the policy on how much they're entitled to actually get back. And, wow. yeah, it's, and it's, he believes it's 100%, but. This is like a sub matter of insurance. Like it's not, but the this tiny little piece of the insurance policy is a whole area of law. Yes, mm -hmm. separate. There are entire law firms devoted to this yes. one tiny Jeez. part of an insurance yes. policy. Wow. Yeah. Um, yeah. And we're the only, we're, yeah. we're, 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 no one else does this. Yeah. yeah. Well, and it also leads to like, not understanding anything about insurance leads to people just saying, oh, well, I'm not going to do anything with it then. Because I don't know, why would I? And then if something horrible happens, you know, mm -hmm. if you have a catastrophe and there's yeah. nothing there to back you up at all, mm -hmm. 
it, it's it can ridiculous. Destroy everything. Yeah, yeah like absolutely. You, said, you yeah. end up homeless. You end up without yeah. credit. You yeah. end up. It's and, your, and you have no help. Right. What and are you What are you going to do? You had an accident, and mm-hmm. uh, they everyone has their hand out for money. Yeah. You don't have money. You can't work. They take your car away. Well, you I can't drive anywhere. Saying, and, I can see how people end up homeless. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then I remember you guys saying that you'd like to build a community oh, yeah. Yeah. to, to you know, help yeah. Yeah. disabled people to yeah. sort of get them back on their feet and move on because you were so devastated yeah. on how much of a toll it took yeah. on yeah. your I ability just, to yeah. uh, you know, you know, take care learning, of yourselves you know, if, financially. If you, if, uh, we're in a position right now, fortunately, being young and recovering with the amputation and the leg that I used to have and everything, I still went back to work as a chef took a head chef's position, still hold that job, even with the amputations. Now I'm working back full time. But there are a lot of things that change for individuals, like if you're paralyzed and you're mm-hmm. now you were a laborer and all of a sudden you can't do that anymore. You need to learn like something new. Husband, you would do that and you would also come home and be in dying Yeah, pain. it was horrible. A, a, a lot of pain just yeah. because you needed to make the money. Yeah. yeah I mean, you would yeah. you would suffer yeah. for days. Just, after, just to pay debts after, that we had piling up. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, and we still, we it's like, it's been four years and we have our savings is like. Oh, we don't have a savings. Closed. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, yeah, but we blew is, through uh, it. I'll ask, I'll ask you guys, and then, and then maybe you both can answer the same question. But what is, um, look, what's what's the message that you want leaders in Washington to hear, based on the experiences that you've had? Yeah. Um, I just want to make sure. No, I, I know, know it's good. I want to think about um, it too, but. I think the biggest takeaway we've taken from this uh, whole experience is that there are so many people in this country who don't have access to the information they need. And then when they do get the information, um, especially regarding healthcare, it's just so confusing and convoluted. And it requires, right now, the way insurance and the medical system works, you have to be privileged to receive any benefits from it. And unfortunately, the system that we deal with right now is just broken. It's about making money for the insurance companies instead of taking the care of the people yeah. who actually need it. Yeah. And that we've we've felt the full force of that in yeah. that we look around and everybody is waiting for their payout while well, we're still struggling to do anything, mm-hmm. I mean, getting back to work, trying to you know buy a house. Yeah. It's it's been it's been yeah. a mess. And, and you are people who have good insurance. Yes, yes exactly. Yeah, you know, exactly. so if you had nothing, um, you know, it's it's yeah. Yeah. I, I think yeah, I think that it the people who need access to healthcare the most are just a group. I think in the US people with disabilities and people with major illnesses and injuries suffer or suffer the most. They they need access to the medical system and it's just so inaccessible. Yep. And I feel so lucky that we live in a part of the world with such great medicine, but it's just not accessible to anyone. I understand that the wages are a part of the reason the doctors, the good doctors want to work here, but it, it's not It's not helping anyone if no one can access it and if no one has insurance. And it's true. Yeah, yeah. I, think it's, I think it's really scary because to me, it seems like in the next few years, as more and more people, the first few of the 26 year olds to face this issue turn 26, we're gonna see people without insurance who die who yep. can't get to the hospital yeah. um, because they can't afford it. Right. And that's just ridiculous in such a great economy. Mm-hmm. A great country. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wealthy country. Yeah. yeah. With so much potential and opportunity that um, it's it's squandered yeah. because of, I mean, it, it's really, it's agreed. Yeah. 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 Mom I, and dad. I, <laughs> I personally remember when they changed the laws to you had to work so many hours a week to get health insurance. And the reason I remember that is because a lot of my friends locally worked at like the state liquor store and they um, were being cut back to 28 and a half hours because they didn't want to pay them health insurance. And these are like hardworking people who, you know, worked hard all their life, carried a couple of jobs, have good families. And I remember when that happened, and I thought to myself, boy, I'm I'm really lucky because I'm on my husband's Mm. health insurance. But those people really suffered. And um, I actually work locally in town as a paraprofessional. And 
I am actually head of my union. And at that time, I was negotiating one of our contracts. And I remember saying, this looks really bad. <laughs> we need to give these people health insurance. Yeah. And we got it. Amazing. And because they agreed. Because when we looked at it as a whole, like as a community, we're, you know, most of the people are, you know, single women, mm -hmm. you know, or, or uh, you know, have one child. And I thought, this is, this is a crime. Yeah. And I remember when that all went down and I thought, this is terrible. And now I'm looking years later at the generation of the 26-year-olds and they all do little micro gigs, you know, they Uber, they, you know, do little contracting jobs. They, you know, they, they do a lot of little things and they don't, ha they don't have health insurance. Yeah. And it's really scary because this is our generation that's coming up and we need to fix that for them yeah. quickly, yeah. quickly. What else is there to say? <laughs> <laughs> I said it all. I guess what I, what I want to say is while this sounds like quite a nightmare, we still find ways to laugh, yeah. which is funny because Ben is the king of puns, so he's got a good sense of dad humor. But I think really, you've heard a lot of big ideas that these guys have come up with. I mean, they're dreamers, they dream big, and they want to be productive members of the community. They are. Uh, they want to you know, advance their own goals, but also be productive members of society. What I would ask anybody in Washington is to just look at the policies and try to help take down those barriers, not just for the 26-year-olds, but all generations. <laughs> mm. yeah. uh, and I think if you did that, then you'd be really accomplishing a lot. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, my, my plan is, some, I call it a single payer plus plan that would ensure, it's loosely modeled after uh, Australia. My brother went there and lived there for, I think, almost 20 years, started his family there. And uh, it, it's, it's a country where people can have the peace of mind that if they need help or if they need care or if they're having a child or if they get into an accident, they'll get that care. No matter who they are or where they come from or how much or how little money they have, they'll be able to get the care that they need. While also, uh, let's say you, you in your situation, you've got an employer who offers a really great health insurance plan and you want to be able to keep it. You should have the opportunity to make that choice for yourself uh, and for your family. And what is, um, I think, so important is, is most important, number one, is that you have the peace of mind that what you will be able to get the care you need when you need it. Yeah. And it's not going to put you out on the street. Mm -hmm. It's not going to ruin your credit. It's not going to ruin or take away the opportunities and the work that you are doing and, and uh, what you hope for yourself and for your family. Mm -hmm. And it also, I think most importantly, it, um, it takes greed and crony capitalism out of the equation so that healthcare decisions really are being made for what's in the best interest of you as the patient. Mm -hmm. uh, if we take big insurance and big pharma away from the policy making table, because right now they have front row seats mm -hmm. and they pay a lot of money to politicians through PACs and lobbyists and contributions to be able to do that. And so some of the best pieces of legislation that I think were begun with good intentions are corrupted by the time they get to the House floor for a vote because those lobbyists are just saying they're putting all these stipulations in there that you don't really realize what they're about mm -hmm. or what they're doing until you're in a situation where you're being directly negatively impacted. Mm -hmm. And so if we take them, if we take this out of the equation, and we are a country where every one of us contributes, uh, as they call it, single payers, or we're contributing towards our collective health care. Um, we're not dealing with trying to uh, line their bottom line or their profits, their high overhead costs, and we're instead just strengthening our health, our health care system. It allows us as a country overall to be able to pay less mm -hmm while ensuring that peace of mind and that quality health care for every single uh, American. And that's, that to me is really what it comes down to. It gives us more leverage as taxpayers mm -hmm. to be able to negotiate lower prescription drug prices mm -hmm. with big pharma as they're looking at, you know, whether it's insulin or, or other yeah. necessary EpiPens. medicines or medications, med EpiPens, yeah, ex et cetera. And, and also it gives, um, it gives us the freedom to be able to make the decisions that are best uh, 
So you're not tied to a job just because they offer you health insurance if you hate your job, that you can make decisions about whether it's pay or experience or the profession you choose, the opportunities that you have uh, based on what's best for you and what's best for your family. And so the, the peace of mind and the freedom that comes with shifting to this system that is focused on health and wellness rather than a, uh, a, a greedy for-profit mm -hmm. um, private sector industry, uh, I think is, is the game changer that we need that will absolutely change um, our quality of life as, as a generation. Um, it, it, this affects every generation. It affects, you know, my parents, your parents, mm -hmm. those who are moving into that phase of life where you're thinking about retirement mm -hmm. and yes. fixed oh, incomes and what mm -hmm. is that going to mean? Mm -hmm. and, and things are constantly changing. Uh, it affects our generation and, and it'll affect the next generation. Mercedes, who's, yeah. you know, coming, <laughs> coming after. Medical. Exactly. <laughs> and Another medical professional to be. There you go. <laughs> So the, you know, for people who say, and, and we're hearing this a lot in, in the presidential debates right now, well, it's impossible. It's a pipe dream. Uh, let's, just, let's just work on um, you know, just expanding, trying to expand healthcare, healthcare for everyone. And, and the problem with, with the, two, the two major proposals that I'm seeing be put forward now is, number one, let's just keep the existing system that we have and try to fix it and try to improve it. Well, to me, the fatal flaw of the existing healthcare system, even though it's helped, right, it's expanded the age mm -hmm. yeah. uh, that, that kids can be covered under their parents' plan, um, you know, pre-existing conditions. There's been some good yeah. things, but the, the fatal flaw is that big insurance and big pharma helped write these mm -hmm. laws. Mm -hmm. And they they wrote them to their favor, and honestly, prolonged to the their benefit, yeah. <clears throat> exactly. <clears throat> mm -hmm. And so unless you deal with that core corrupting element, we're not, we will not get to the place where we need to be, where every single person, whether you're coming from a place of privilege, as you said, or not, that you can have the peace of mind that our healthcare system is working for yeah. us. Mm -hmm. On the other end of the spectrum, people who are saying, well, you know what, we need to eliminate the private insurance industry completely and say that every American uh, has only one option, and that option is what some will call Medicare for all, or whatever mm -hmm. whatever the label is. Uh, to me, that's not that's not the right answer either, because ultimately this is about choice mm -hmm. and peace of mind, and making sure that every one of us can make the choices that work best for us, uh, and and our loved ones and our family. And so, you know, look, it's it's this has been this change has happened already in every developed country in the world. Mm -hmm. Um, what we need is the strength and courage of leaders in this country to actually do what's best for our people, not what's best for their lobbyist friends uh, or big pharma and big insurance mm -hmm. who are chirping in their ears about what's best for them to the detriment of, of our loved ones, our families, and, and the people of this country. And so this is um, the, the incredible thing that I'm seeing here is a woman asked me last night on New Year's Eve in, in, uh, in Portsmouth, she's like, but how are you gonna do it? Mm -hmm. Well, the beautiful thing is everywhere we're going, people across party lines, Republicans, independents, Democrats, um, so many people are going through really difficult challenges with regards to healthcare and they all wanna see this fixed and every one of them agree that our healthcare system should work for us, mm -hmm. not for these massive mm -hmm. for-profit corporations. Yeah. And so it's really Washington that's the challenge and that's the obstacle. And I know that if, if you know, we the people exercise our voices and put that pressure on the leaders in this country, that we can make that shift to get this uh, corruption and kind of this pay to play culture that exists out of our healthcare system, we can and we will make this change. Yeah. That's awesome. It'd be great. Yeah. yeah. We need to I like that it. you looked at Australia. Everyone always looks at <coughs> small countries. Mm -hmm. And it, it's when you think about like uh, moving like an economic idea from a tiny country to a huge country, usually it's not going to work. Right. And I really, I never even thought to look at Australia. Yeah. Yeah. It's, you know, it's, it's a little bit of a different model from Canada. It's, yeah. a, it's a different model from the UK. And we've been looking because this is really what it is. Let's look at 
what, we're not trying to do something brand new here. Right. Yeah. Right. Let's look right. at what has worked best, yeah. what ha you know, yeah. lessons right. learned, and no, we don't have to reinvent yeah. the wheel. Yeah. And, and just model it after a system that works for us. Yeah. Simplify it, streamline it, make sure that our taxpayer dollars are actually working for us, mm -hmm. yeah. and make sure that yeah. we're still able to, to support the kind of research and innovation that allows us to have the greatest healthcare system in the world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Thank you guys so yeah, much. Of course, thank you. Yeah. This is, well, we, we appreciate your allowing us to be able to share it yeah. with other people yeah, and uh, to help empower other people. I think that's one of the one of the things about your campaign that has definitely won us over the most, um, especially since meeting you, um, is that you're willing to spend that time to know what's going on with the people. Yeah, you're not yes. just showing up in a town, and waving and going home. It's, yeah. it's you've actually been here for huge. the past four days yeah. and, and like, before and that. You can and just <laughs> tell, like when you're here, you focus. Like yeah. you you're, you're not worried about where you need to be next. It's really cool. Thank really you. appreciate yeah. it. You Thank can tell you. you really care about the people. Thank you. Yeah. You really that's, do. We need somebody like you in the I'm White doing House. This. We Thank do. you. <laughs> Thank we do. you. We need and, that. And how, uh, you know, as a leader, how can I make decisions? Um, to serve the best interests of the people in our country if if I'm not listening, yeah. Yeah. you know, yeah. to what's really going on and, and just going off of what somebody tells me or some report that's written. That's, that's just, this is, the, this is the problem is, and I've been in D.C. for long enough to know that the briefings that we get or the people who come and talk to us, they have their own uh, motives. Mm -hmm. And it's just as, as uh, it's, it's just, it's, it's heartbreaking to see how disconnected Washington is from reality. Mm. So, I'm sorry, I just have a... Yeah. So, like, when you say if we put the pressure on um, to to make the healthcare work for us, you you think there's a way to make sure that the um, lobbyists aren't... At, the lobbyists for Big Pharma yeah. are, and the insurance companies aren't as involved in writing the bill because yeah. it's it's a two to me it's a two step process uh, and I think they need to happen simultaneously because the healthcare industry is not the only one that's infected with this kind of corruption um, legal really it's legal corruption in our system mm -hmm. so you know there I, there are there's anti corruption legislation that I think needs to be passed in Congress we're working on a bill now that basically does simple things like a, members of Congress shouldn't be able to take pack checks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You take that away and then it changes the whole dynamic. Yeah. I've seen it happen. Uh, members of Congress, it, it did. I, yeah. I saw it because when I first got elected to Congress, I took PAC money from, I never took Mac, PAC money from Big Pharma, from Wall Street banks, there was just, but you know, I just, I saw the way that it worked because you go and you go to these receptions and you have breakfasts and lunches and dinners and their fundraisers and a whole bunch of lobbyists come. They go to like 10 or 15 of these a day. That's all they do oh, wow. is go and they've got a stack of checks, they hand them out. Oh, and gosh. for them, it's about access. You get in, you can have the conversation so that when you're thinking about a bill, they come in and say, hey, well, here's what we think about it. And obviously they're coming from uh, the interest that they represent, yeah. that yeah. they're paid a heck of a lot of money to represent. And that's just the way that it works. Yeah. And and it, it, um, it supports this entrenched system mm -hmm. where once members of Congress get elected, you become part of this really kind of a uh, small community of, mm -hmm. of elite, powerful, mm -hmm. influential mm -hmm. people. And whether you realize it's happening or not, um, that becomes your power base and support base and your community rather than the community of people who actually elected you. Yeah. And I had a conversation with a guy, you know, in 20, the last few elections, we've seen how more and more people are saying, hey, if I give 20 bucks or if I give whatever I can to a candidate, uh, you can have a really people powered campaign. You can win an election without the establishment support. Mm -hmm. And I spoke with one of my colleagues um, about how amazing this was mm -hmm. because it was total, it was a game changing thing. And he just said, Tulsi, you don't understand. This is a threat to every single incumbent member of Congress mm -hmm. because this means that anybody can go and challenge us in a primary election or in a general election uh, without the support of the establishment mm -hmm. and win. Yeah. And he was really like, he, he was afraid mm -hmm. of it. 
which is like that that is exactly the point. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly the point. So we get rid of pack checks. We make it so members of Congress can't go and become lobbyists after yes. they're done so that they can't go and get payouts from the industries that they're supposed to be providing oversight over and really just make sure that our government is one that is is um, filled with people who are there to serve, yeah. who are there to serve, yeah. like teachers, mm-hmm. like nurses, like mm-hmm. firefighters, law enforcement. Mm-hmm. You, you choose to do this because you want to serve, right. yeah. not because you want to leverage it into a big million-dollar payout yeah. uh, at the end of it. So the two things is focusing on the anti-corruption, mm-hmm while also specifically related to healthcare, bring about the changes in our healthcare laws to get to um, the objective of, of what, what I talked about, where every single American is able to get the healthcare that they need. Yeah, mm-hmm. okay. so important. Yeah. It is, it's critical, yeah. it's critical. Getting, I love that point of getting, um, making it so that Congress, uh, people who were members of Congress no longer have unlimited access to the floor because mm, yep. that's such you a problem. Any, yeah. talking about this. Of course not, yeah. because a lot of them are members of Congress, <laughs> and they don't, uh, honestly, no, and they they think. Don't know about yeah, it. I right. wouldn't know about that right. if I didn't take a class exactly. on it. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Right. Yep. Yeah. yeah. I know because in, in middle school we teach, you know, you know, House of Representatives mm-hmm. and the Senate, and then a bill goes through mm-hmm. and they vote, and if mm-hmm. it passes, it goes to them, and then yep. you know, we teach the very basics. Yeah, exactly. So it learn. looks like so simple, you know yeah. what I mean? I didn't learn that Congress mm-hmm. members get access to the floor unlimited until my junior year of college. Yeah. Yeah. And no, it's, most people don't. Yeah. Most yeah. people don't even know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Very interesting. And why it matters. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah exactly. That's really the thing. Like, like the whole class I took on it was specifically survey research. It was specifically about how to work the system. Yep. And you were taught you want to become a lobbyist because yep. then you get all the power. Yep. Um, There's a woman who was a member of Congress for a long time. Um, I think she she was on the Committee of Jurisdiction over Energy. Yeah. She resigned from Congress and walked straight into a job paying her starting salary was like $1.3 million. Mm-hmm. Oh, my God. Mm-hmm. With jurisdiction over energy related policy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Why not serve one term? And then, well, yeah. yeah. I, I think it needs to be longer than one term yeah. just to be able no, to do I stuff. Mean, like, but, but the point is, is, like, oh, yeah. go, and do it yeah. go and yeah. serve. Go and serve. You know, don't, don't, don't go in through this revolving door, um, you know, just where you're, you're trying to leverage it yeah. for your own financial benefit. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You didn't tell her the best part about your last name. Oh, it's we made it up. Oh yeah, so it's when we got in, married, we changed both of our last names together in honor of my grandmother after she passed away. Her name was Jean. Yeah. So we changed both of our last names to St. Jean when we yeah. got married. Wow. Yeah. So yeah. what was your name before? Cole. Yeah. yeah. And, Mine was and McCoy. Amazing. <laughs> yeah. well, we're in the process of getting Yeah, it's yeah. still yeah. legally Yeah, we're still trying done, to figure everything out legally. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's you have to through probate. But, whatever. Yeah. Because yeah. when a boy wants to change their last name, it's difficult. Of course. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. yeah. Of course. Why would you do that? Yeah. 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 That's so awesome. awesome. Thank you guys so much. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Really, really special. Oh.